And there's a saying that disruption is a gift that is either given to you or you give to someone else. I'm a hopeless optimist, and I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to look around us in new ways, to see new things, in order to explore these new possibilities. And I think nothing says innovation like PowerPoint slides. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I put some slides together for you. So I took it to heart. You're obviously doing great work already. I think one of the things that I benefit from, which is living in Silicon Valley, is that life by design moves very fast. It's also very expensive, but it also moves very fast. I can walk in my neighborhood and I will see robots on wheels scurry past me delivering food and groceries to homes and offices. And it's right out of the Jetsons, and it's for real. You should pull out an app, order something, and a robot will come to your door. But the pillars of which you're bu building your future upon are the right ones. It's human-centered, it's outside-in, it's inside-out. The thing that I ask is that we look outside of ourselves to appreciate the world through the eyes, mind, and heart of another, to help inspire and guide us in the work that we do. Meeting people where they are can be solved through technology. Digital transformation is often a misnomer because we tend to emphasize the digital in digital transformation. But it's more than that. Your heart, your faith, your dedication is actually ahead of the technology. And it is going to be the foundation of which is going to help your innovation and your future come to life in a much more meaningful way. Technology just becomes an enabler for that. And trust me, I live in innovation all day, every day. And inside and outside of any organization, the greatest challenges are always human, just like the greatest opportunities are always human. We live in a time of what I call digital Darwinism. Regardless of our opinions of what's happening, especially of what's happening on Facebook, technology and society evolve. It just does. What doesn't keep up until tested, our mindsets, processes, policies, our ways of working, and our metrics of what success could look like. I think many of us remember Kodak. It's often used as an example of what happens when you don't embrace digital. I want to tell a different side of the Kodak story because many of us, I think, remember the Kodak moment. It was not just a tagline, it was a way of life. I think we all had someone, whether it was ourselves or someone within our family, who was the keeper of our memories. That album or albums or the shoe boxes that would come out every time you had a family gathering, or you were dating someone and they just wanted to embarrass you. Pictures in the Kodak moment were memories. And those memories came to life as a gathering. It's part of our culture. But when digital came along, and what Kodak failed to realize is that digital changed our relationship with pictures. Many of us haven't really recognized it yet because it happened over time and gradually. But if you were to look at all of the pictures on your phone right now, you would realize that the majority of them are never ever going to be seen again. We now take pictures to capture experiences in the moment, never to be relived again, just to be relived either now with those around you or now with those who follow you on social media. It's not a bad thing, it's just an evolution and it's human. 
Technology changed our behavior, and that's what's happening all around us. Even if it's not changing our lives to the extent or the speed of others, it is changing society. And so often in my work, I just sense the struggle or the frustration of people trying to figure out what it means, where do I start, and what do I do? None of us are alone in this. In fact, it is one of the reasons why there is so much disruption in the world, because there aren't very many answers. In some of the research, for example, that I've done around the world, when I talk to executives and I talk to employees about innovation, there's always a gap. Many organizations see themselves as being more innovative than employees, everyday employees actually see. But when you look hard and fast, you see specifically that all around the world, this is why you're not alone. In fact, this is why you're ahead of most. Only 7% of companies in this world right now are investing in a culture of innovation. So you're ahead of the game. Now it's a personal journey. The organization is opening the door, and every great story of corporate innovation is also powered by human innovation, personal transformation, to see things and do things differently. Because I find all too often, whether it's at work or whether it's in our personal lives, it's really easy to find reasons why we can't do something. It keeps us on the path that we know. It's very familiar. It's very comforting. And there's nothing wrong with that, except when we have to work and think differently to compete in a world that is evolving. All through our life, in school, at home, and at work, we were taught to follow the rules. And we've become good people by following the rules. And this is what makes innovation so hard, because innovation is asking you, OK, follow the rules over there. But over here, let's break some rules. Or let's create some new rules. And so this is why it's about personal transformation, because we have to embrace and accept at some point a new comfort zone. I host businesses and executives from all around the world on what I call the Disneyland tour or the Hollywood Homes tour of the famous tech companies around Silicon Valley. Busloads of executives will come to see Facebook and Google and Uber and you name it. And I think that they all think that if they can come through those doors of each of those companies and drink some of the water, that they'll leave innovative. But the secret is mindset. You have to believe that you play a role in the future of your organization. And when we talk about innovation, we talk about what it means to be innovative, it's one of those words that we just kind of throw out there. That's what I want to talk about. Because innovation isn't just in technology. Innovation isn't just in building new products and services. Innovation is also in how we think and how we work, the policies, the processes, everything that we create to help us move our comfort zone and find comfort in doing so. It's one of those things. The minute you open your mind to new possibilities, you will actually see everything right in front of you. And it's one, if even personally, it's just one of those things where you don't realize it until someone points it out to you. And then you're, oh, I totally get it. That's where innovation begins, is that you feel it's OK to see something differently. I'll give you an example. Every single day, we click a 3 and a half inch <laughs> floppy disk to save a file. And we've never questioned it. It's just what we do. But then there's a whole other generation of colleagues and patients and consumers 
who have no idea what I just said. What is a three and a half inch floppy disk? To them, it's just the save icon. They have no idea what I'm talking about. And when we're making decisions in their best interests, we tend to do so from the mindset that we operate from. Our experiences, our successes, our failures have brought us to these moments of where we make decisions based on what we know. To try to make decisions based on those assumptions and experiences for what's best for the future. But we live in a time where we're making decisions for people who haven't come from the same past. So when you bring those worlds together, it kind of looks like this. Hey, kid, have you ever seen one of these before? Well, it's so cool that you 3D printed the save icon. <laughs> this is part of the challenge of inventing the future is looking through the eyes of someone else to experience the empathy or the emotional journey of someone else, understanding how they discover, how they make decisions, how they share and learn. And often, they don't intersect. And this is why true innovation is personal. There's a famous saying about light bulbs, that they're not the result of the continuous improvement of candles. At some point, as we know, there had to be tests and failures and tests and failures into something new. Any one of us would have probably given up. Most of us probably wouldn't have had the idea. But now we're asking you to unleash those ideas. And there's a very important distinction between iteration and innovation that I want to share with you. They're both necessary, but they're both different. Most often when I study innovation at larger companies, not necessarily startups, but at larger companies, most confuse innovation with what's actually iteration. And iteration, for example, is taking new technologies and doing the same things better at scale. But innovation is introducing anything that's new, that creates new value. And you combine those two together and you get disruption. And disruption is doing new things that make the old things obsolete. When we talk about meeting people where they are, we need a combination of both of these things. We have to make our processes and services and policies better but maybe we also need to introduce new products, services, and policies to introduce new value so that when someone experiences you, they walk away feeling that that is the standard of engagement that sets the bar for everything else. Otherwise, it's beneath the bar that they feel is the standard. And this is where innovation becomes key, is that looking outside of your industry will help guide you to find that bar. Experience is probably the most important catalyst for innovation today. I'm gonna to give you an example of iteration and innovation. <laughs> it's like the floppy disk. We all find a way to just live with this thing. But I don't think You've had a friend over and they say, you know what, don't you just love that thing? Don't you just love operating this very thin, futuristic television that's come so far in so little time with a brick? In fact, I studied what, what went wrong. You know, on average, today's remote control has 70 buttons on it in an era where you're probably talking to Alexa, pinching and zooming on your phone or tablet. In just a little while, you'll be able to think what you want to watch. And yet we have this brick. Well, guys, we're in the engineering lab. What can we do to iterate or innovate the remote control? Well, you know, I saw this thing called Netflix. 
seems to be popular with all the kids. Let's put another button on the remote. <laughs> That's innovation. 71. <laughs> so over time, while it might feel like we're innovating, it's an example of iteration. And this is where true innovation begins, is a shift in perspective. How are you going to look at things differently? Because all too often, whether we know it or not, it's very human, is when we look at all of this technology and all of this change in the world, we tend to judge it rather than understand it. And by judging it, it sort of protects ourselves from feeling like we're getting left behind. It just solidifies our position in what we know and how we got here, which is fine, except we're working towards innovation, so we have to take a step outside of that. True perspective starts when we open our eyes, when we open our minds, and we allow it inside to feel it, to appreciate it, and then to let that guide our ideas, our ideation, and our execution because it opens new doors. Because iteration is just going through the same old doors, trying to do it better. When we look around the world, you see a distinct perspective gap between what decisions are being made versus what people do and want. And this is called the experience divide. And this experience divide is what sets the stage for disruption in anything. You could look at Netflix and Blockbuster. You could look at Kodak and digital photography. You could look at Amazon and Sears. You could look at Amazon and Borders. You could look at Amazon and all grocery stores. There's just different sets on either side of those decisions. And the way I look at it is, are we making decisions rooted in what we know and believe, or are we making decisions in what we need to know and understand? This is almost like a new Warshaw test. What do you see when you see it? Often, many people focus on the sweet woman here in the front row, because we can identify with her. Because many of us in these moments are in the moment. And so when we look at this, some of us might think deep down, we might not voice it, but we might think it. This is exactly what's wrong with the world today. If any of you have gone to a concert recently, same thing. Why are you at this concert with your phones out, with the live music right up here playing for you? We need to be in the moment. You should experience it. Not like everybody else who just can't put their phones down. I don't even know why we still call them phones, but it's another discussion. But that's the challenge of innovation, is because we project ourselves into a moment to make a decision which is actually in our best interest, not their best interest. Which again, is fine for life to an extent, but when it comes to innovation, what this is asking you to do is not judge this moment. Instead, embrace it and understand how do you connect? How do you go to where they are? How do you speak their language? Not just give them technology, but how do you speak their language to deliver the types of services and experiences that make this moment worth capturing and remembering? So with a shift in perspective, you could say, wow. Look at this selfish woman here in the front, not sharing this very special moment with all of her Facebook friends that couldn't be there. 